If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Mark, the Gospel of Mark. So if you were to look in the Bible, you would go to the New Testament. That's on the right-hand side of the Bible. And then you'll go, the, the second book is Mark. Mark is a gospel. Mark, what gospels are is they are perspectives on the life of Jesus. And so as we get started, what, what Lindley mentioned this a minute ago, what we're going to do really for this through June, in one way or another, we're going to be working through the gospel of Mark. Now we're going to split it up in a different series. We're going to make sure that it, that it stays kind of interesting and on point with, with, with applicable stuff. But we're also going to be systematically working through this to teach you all Mark very well. Why are we going to do that, Jason? Why do you think we need to, to learn? Why are we going to spend that much time in one subject? Why don't we do some of these topical stuff? I know a lot of churches do topical stuff. Why are we going to work through Mark? Number one, we're not against topical. We'll do topical sometimes. But number two, I've felt for some time like there is a need for our church and for churches in general, really, to spend extended time looking at the person and work of Jesus. I feel like our church needs to get a glimpse of, of all that he is who he is. And he is. Now, we talk about Jesus every week. Like that, We're not a church that doesn't talk about Jesus. We talk about Jesus all the time. But I also want us to get a systematic approach where we're going to look into how his ministry, how his life unfolded, how his life ended up ending, and how he rose again, and then individual teachings that are going to strike us to our core, I hope. Uh, that, that, that's the hope in the book of Mark. And why, why we look for the book of Mark like that? Well, Mark's the shortest gospel. Uh, it's only 16 chapters. So if you're looking for, all right, Jason, I, I want to read a gospel. I want to look at something. I want to look at the life of Jesus. And I want to do it quick. Mark's the place to go. Uh, I know some friends who have taught through the book of Matthew or the book of Luke. Great. We'll do that maybe one day, but it took them three years. I felt like um, my attention span couldn't handle three years. I don't know about yours. Uh, so we're going to go through the book of Mark. Uh, to supplement it, you're going to hear about this. I'm going to refer to it again later. We have uh, created a devotional. Uh, it's, it's really an inductive Bible study that's going to be available on the way out. It's going to be available on the website, and it's going to cover each of these series as we work our way through it. In it, each week there's going to be three texts, uh, three texts that we want you to work through so you read it, then you repeat it. Then there's some uh, a little commentary in there, just you know, three, four, five sentences of commentary about that. And then we want you to recap it. And then we want you to relate to it. We've provided some questions to help you relate to that. And then write requests. And really, that's two pages. And I've done this for the last month or so, working through what I'm giving you guys now. And it takes about 20 minutes to do one entire devotion if you just work through some of the verses and write them out. So if you're looking for Jason, I need a way to like do some devotions. Here it is. We want to provide it for you. We want to make it easy for you. We want to put it in front of you. Now, if you want it in Word format, we can, we'll put the Word format out there. If you're an Evernote person like me, anybody use Evernote? Anybody? All right. Me and the four other people here who are super smart. Uh, use Evernote. It's the greatest app ever made. Um, we'll put even those out there for you because that's how I've been doing it, is working through Evernote in there. Uh, this, I hope, is going to be a blessing to you. I understand. Here, here's the thing. Somebody asked me, Jason, you realize that not everybody in the church is going to do that. And I said, yes, I understand this very well. But if we get 5% or 10% of our church to work through the gospel of Mark when they've never done it before, or even just work a little bit through it, man, we've made such big strides. That's what our hope is. We want people to look and see and savor who Jesus is and what he's done. That is the hope that I have for this church in this year. Mark chapter 1 is where we're going to be today. Mark is the second gospel, and it's written to the Romans. Uh, all the gospels kind of have a specific audience that they're aiming for. Matthew is written to, to the Jews. And so when you look, look through Matthew, what you're going to end up seeing in Matthew is a lot of references to the Old Testament. You're going to see all, all these different spots, all these different uh, references to the Old Testament. When you look at Luke, Luke's a doctor. One thing about doctors is they like, they like to use their big vocabulary. They think they're really smart, and Luke was really smart. And so he has the largest vocabulary, if you look in the Greek, of any of, of any of them. And he's writing, Luke's a Greek, and so Luke's writing to 
Greeks. John, we, we covered John kind of the first year at City View when we, when we started in 2014. And John is really, it's a very simple book, and it's written to the entire world. And, and Mark is a short book, and it's written to Romans. Think about a little history for me. If you were to look at ancient times, Rome was the occupying force of Israel. And Rome saw all the, peri- all the places, all the cities, all the countries that they occupied, saw those places, saw those cities, saw those countries, uh, not as uh, co-heirs, but as servants. And the people within those countries, he, Rome saw them as servants. And so when, when Mark is writing this gospel, he is writing, showing Jesus as the perfect servant. He's showing him, he's showing who he is and how he serves people. And he's, and what Mark does, and what I love about Mark, the way I love reading through it, is these little quick snippets. He doesn't go extended into much. He goes quick snippets into little pieces of Jesus and what he's done. Because when Romans look at Jesus, they aren't interested in all the ins and outs of his Old Testament beginnings. There's some in Mark, but they aren't interested in all of it because they aren't familiar with all the Jewish literature. Do you know what I mean? When you, and and they're not interested in diving deep into the Greeks. When they were to look at Jesus, they want to know everything about this man. So they want intricacies and they want details. That's not how Mark is. That's not how Rome is. That's not how they're looking at who Jesus is and what he's done. So Mark, you're going to get these brief little snippets that's uh, almost episodic, kind of like a, it's like a little telenovela of, of the life of Jesus. So let's walk through. We're going to do Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 15 is what we're going to go through today. I'm, we're not going to read it all in one shot. I'm going to go a few verses at a time or maybe just a couple words at a time and talk through some stuff. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at who, who is Jesus, And then how are we supposed to respond to Jesus? Very simple. Who is Jesus? And then how are we supposed to respond to him? Let's look at verse 1. So it goes like this. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stop. That's where we're going to stop. Jesus Christ. So Christ is a a Greek word that translates a Hebrew word for Messiah. And what it means is anointed one. And when we're talking about Jesus as the Christ, here, my, my kids, we were talking about, we were talking about Jesus at, uh, we're doing our, our Bible study at night during Christmas, and I was walking through, like, who Jesus' parents were with, with Blaze and Judd, and, you know, they're, they're Mary and Joseph, and I, and I said, Judd, who are, who are Jesus' parents? And he said, Mr. and Mrs. Christ, and, and it was like, all right, buddy, I mean, I understand for like a four-year-old, that, that's kind of a weird thing to understand, but, but that, that's actually a title. So maybe that's where you are too. Maybe you're like, wait a second, that's what I thought too. I thought it was Mary and Joseph Christ. It's not. I understand. Uh, don't, don't feel like a four-year-old. Because Christ is a title. It's not a name. It's not Jesus Jesus Christ, and then he has some other last name or no middle name. This is his title. He is the anointed one. So when you read through the New Testament, if you were to look and you see Jesus Christ in Paul's writings, if you see it, uh, when you see it in other gospels or in the book of Acts, it's not just some other name that's put there. It is a gigantic title that is placed on him. So when we look at that, when you read those first five or six words of Mark, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is not a small thing to see those words Christ. He is anointed, and he is promised, and he is the one that we were told was going to come, the one that Jews were told was going to come. But I don't want to step on my next point. He is the Christ. Number two. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, we've grown up in an American culture, a Texas culture, many of us, where we hear Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and we don't think anything of that. 
But think of the revolutionary nature of the first reading of this. Romans are reading this for the first time. Peter is the one who's writing, who's giving, who's dictating to Mark, and Mark's writing it out. And, and, and as that happens and new readers hear this, they're hearing Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What? The Son of God. So Roman ears hear this, and they think, all right, mythology, you got Jupiter, you, you, you've you got Roman mythology, which just really copied the Greek mythology, because Romans were never really original. Um, and and they, they, they had this whole idea of, of, of how gods were and what they did and how they'd have kind of like demigods. And so the idea here is he's divine. This Jesus is divine. He's of divine nature. But then do you, do you see that little word? There's the son of God, and there's a little article right before that. I know, we're pretty, tech, pretty technical this morning. There's a little article right before that. The article is the. There's, my wife is an English teacher. She loves English. She would, she, I gave her one of my papers to write for my doctorate, or to, not to write, to look at. She edited it. I wrote it, I swear. And, and I gave it to her to look at, and when it came back to me, um, like there was a little bit of black on the page, but mostly red, and that made me sad. Um, she, my wife would point out to you that, that that's a definite article. There's an indefinite article called A. So if you were to say the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a son of God, well, to the Roman mind, that would be like, okay, a son of God. Well, I get that. There's all kinds of sons of God out there in terms of how we think through mythology. All right, this is just a mythology thing for you. But when you put the definite article in front of it, the definite article in front of Son of God, it's not just A, but now it's V, which means there is no other. This is definitively who Jesus is. He is the Christ anointed one. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of God. This is what this whole book is about. It is the gospel the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, the good news that there is someone who has been anointed and someone who is the son of God. Anointed son of God, not a, the, and he is who I'm going to throw, he is who I'm going to explain throughout the rest of this book. Let's go on. Uh, Verse 2. As is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. We're going to go just a little further. Verse 4. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So what's happening now, we've transitioned from this title of the beginning of, how, of who Jesus is to a person that you're familiar with, likely, if you've grown up in church, named John the Baptist, who wore some really awesome clothes and ate bugs. Uh, my kids love this story of John the Baptist. They love looking at the pictures in our Jesus Storybook Bible of a man with camel hair on, and he's eating grasshoppers and honey. They think that's hilarious, and we've reminded them, that was Old Testament times. You don't need to do that anymore. So we, we are not really Old Testament times. It's intertestamental. This is Jesus. This is John, and John is an interesting figure. We, it's easy to get kind of off on who John is and what he's doing, and and if you do the devotional, you'll have the opportunity, opportunity to. But John is someone who is a forerunner. He's a harbinger. He's someone who's coming to announce someone else is coming. Now, John is a massive figure. In fact, Jesus himself goes on to say that no man has been born in this earth who is as good as John. Like that John is the best that, that this world has to offer in terms of man. John is a wonderful character. He's a great guy. He's actually Jesus' first cousin, so, you know, it's a family thing. And, and John is baptizing people, and he's doing it in accord with something that was prophesied before. 
that John is going to be baptizing people and that he is going to come with the power and spirit of Elijah. That's something that's prophesied in the Old Testament. And it's actually in Isaiah and Malachi. Jason, I thought you said that he wasn't going to talk about that a whole lot. He's not going to talk about that a whole lot, but he is going to bring it up to show you that there's some linkage here. So number three, write this down. Jesus is Yahweh from the Hebrew Scriptures. So this word Yahweh is a... Uh, like not really familiar to us. If you were to look in your Old Testament, when you see Lord capitalized, that's the word Yahweh. It, this, is, uh, this is called the Tetragrammaton, for those of you who are kind of into the more technical aspects of, of how all of the Old Testament works and what Hebrew looks like. So that's probably like one of you, probably. Um, this word was so special to those who are copying the Old Testament that they would, they would take the letter, they would take the Old Testament, whatever it was, and they would be translating it or writing it, and they would look at it over here and copy it over here. This is kind of the way the Old Testament was transferred and copied to other people before we had the Gutenberg printing press. And you guys are loving this, aren't you? History lesson, right? Sorry, that's what it is today. Um, they, would write a, they would look at it here and write it over here, look here, write over here. And when, when they would get to the Tetragrammaton, which in Hebrew is just four letters, when they would get to it, they would go and wash themselves ceremonially before they wrote it. They would go back, they would write it, then they would go and wash themselves ceremonially again afterwards, and then they would go back and continue on writing. Because this name of God is the most personal name of God, that this name of God is who God said that he was, that he is the I am that I am, that this is who God is. And when John is coming to baptize, he's coming to be the forerunner for the one who is Yahweh. So when the New Testament says that this is who John is, it's also saying that this is who Jesus is that Jesus is the one foretold, the one who was active in the beginning of creation, that he's the one who's been referred to for thousands of years, and that now he stands in front of you, and John came and baptized. But this Jesus stands in front of you, and he is Lord of all. He is Yahweh. He is the great and precious one, the strong one, the giant of Hebrew scriptures. Number four. <clears throat> Let's look at verse six. It goes, now John was clothed with camel's hair. Sounds delightful. And wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So if you look at, he is Christ, he is the Son of God, he is Yahweh, and now what John's saying is, I'm not even worthy to bow down and touch his feet. I'm not even worthy to bow down and touch his feet. This is Old Testament language. This is even Roman language for the way Caesar would be treated, that people weren't able to bow down and touch Caesar's feet. They weren't able to go near him. This is language for a king. So this is, hey, reader, he is Christ. He is the Son of God. He is Yahweh. He is the king. He's the promised king. He is better than your Caesar. He is greater than, than your ruler, greater than your emperor, greater than the empire that you currently live in. He is king. This is countercultural. Because you weren't allowed to say that there was anyone greater than Caesar. In Roman world, it was Hail Caesar, and it was just Hail Caesar. In Roman world, it was, it was this is who, Caesar is, is seen as divine. Caesar is seen as great. That, that is who he is understood to be. And the New Testament writers say, no, Jesus. Jesus is greater. The, 
The book of Mark is written down by Mark, but it is given to him by Peter. Peter is the one in the, in the New Testament who's constantly doing something stupid. He's the one who's, who's shouting when he shouldn't shout, who's cutting off ears in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's the mess. He's the one who at one moment says, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. And then the next moment says, Jesus, I think you got this wrong. Like he's, Peter's a little bit of a mess. And he's the one writing this out. He's the one explaining it to Mark to write it out. And what you're going to end up seeing, and what ends up happening to Peter, is he ends up being crucified. But when he is crucified, according to tradition, he says, I'm unworthy to be crucified like my Lord was crucified. And so he asks his torturer, his executioner, to put him in upside down so that he would be crucified upside down. This is the extent that these men who preach Jesus were willing to go to to extol, to praise, and to glorify who Jesus is. That they understood him to be the Christ. They understood him to to be the Son of God, Yahweh, King. That they were willing to be political exiles and really political martyrs, but really more spiritual martyrs for this one. So there's a lot of questions sometimes. Is Jesus really God? Is is he really worth dying for? And you would just point to the life of these men, these these men like John who's boiled in oil, or or Thomas who's who's martyred out in India, or Peter who's crucified upside down, that these followers of Jesus really understood him to be God, really understood him to be Yahweh, really understood him to be the one promised. Number five. Look at verse 9. Uh, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, now imagine being there, because here's what's happening. You're, you're near the Jordan River, which is a river kind of in the, in the eastern part of Israel. And people are going out to John, getting baptized there. It's a, it's a thing that's happening. All of Judea, which is kind of a state, is going out there. Men are going out there constantly. And so the, the river's banks are lined. There are people there watching. And then Jesus shows up to get baptized, gets baptized. And then in verse 10, and when he came up out of the water, so, you know, we did a baptism last week, little Tegan, super sweet. Go online, look at that video. It was amazing. She came out of the water and she was like, she was smiled. When Jesus came out of the water, um, the, the sky broke open. Okay. We were excited. Tegan cried a little bit. That was really sweet. I cried when I got baptized. I cried when I got to baptize Drew a few months ago. It was amazing. He cried because I was crying probably. He's a lot, you know, tougher than I am. And, but like that, our eyes broke open. When Jesus gets done being baptized, the sky breaks open. Like, imagine being there, like watching that. And then when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. So now there's a thing that kind of looks like a dove that's coming down from the broken open sky. Like you're there repenting of your sin and going underwater yourself and then watching your buddy who lives down the street and your coworker and you're watching all that and then Jesus goes down and then the sky breaks open and, and something looks like a bird goes down and kind of is hovering like this and, and, uh, and, and then it gets weirder and a voice came from heaven. Oh, so the place where it broke open where the bird's coming down, now there's a voice happening. Uh, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Okay. Guy came up out of the water. There's a bird that came out of that broken sky going up and down. And now there's a voice. What? What you have here is this picture of the Trinity. Got God the Father speaking. 